to start, Anya and I are both conceptual artists, so that manifests in many different ways. So my background is in immersive art and also human-computer interaction, so um, also technology manifesting in a more physical computing aspect where it's integrated into your environment rather than only interacting with the screen um, or obvious technology. And Anya, do you want to talk about I like about that obvious technology. Obvious technology. <laughs> and my background is in choreography and performance art. So I grew up dancing, training in multiple methods, then got into choreography and then later into performance and working with untrained dancers and just exploring um, the natural language of the human body with people who are not trained, which also led into not just live performances, but also directing films that are kind of movement and performance centric. So that's kind of all the pathways. Mm -hmm. And so where are practices kind yeah, well, of we, convoluted? Yeah, go ahead. Well, we first started, we first like met and we're thinking like projection and choreography. So it started with a kind of like, I would say obvious, obvious <laughs> version of like where what I do and what Deja does w would meet. Mm -hmm. And then we met and then we didn't do something with choreography and projection until like 12 months later. But what we did do is start sharing references. And like the first time we met, we both left with a napkin of things that we were like, you need to watch this. You need to read this. You would love that. Oh, you haven't seen this. We have to watch it together. So from the but, very but beginning, that was partially flirting because we're also married. Uh, so that was partially flirting and that is like how, off to that's each other, how we but flirt. Also, yeah. Well, what now. I'm saying okay. back <laughs> to the conceptual art part is that, <laughs> but back to the conceptual art is that it like we first were like, oh, from a distance, projection, choreography, like obvious technology merge of that would be cool then we got together and we realized there were so many other things about what we loved what we appreciated what we didn't like what we were interested in what we were curious about so we ended up having this whole like nine months of just kind of like learning each other's worlds and sharing references and sharing things that we loved and then finally we did do something with projection and choreography which is a film called line scanner mm -hmm. Which ended up being really cool, and it was very spontaneous, um, but it ended up being a really cool piece. And then I think from there... But we in just... a way, that was kind of the obvious choice. That was the obvious. We so... just had to get the obvious yeah, thing out get... of the way yeah. at the beginning, <laughs> and then we could get to the stuff where it's like, right. okay, we're really challenging, right. and we're really pushing each other's you know, yeah. mediums forward, and asking big questions, and doing stuff that hasn't mm -hmm. really been done yet, which is right. And what then, we're still doing now. Yeah, yeah. And so if, if we were to explain it uh, in a more concise way, um, uh, Anya and I's practice, it's, uh, Anya and I's collaborative practice integrates environments, performance, and creative tech. And we take all of those aspects and integrate them usually in an experiential way, um, meaning that the work um, really requires uh, an audience kind of as a participant mm -hmm. rather than a passive viewer. Um, in order to gain something from the experience, they have to interact. And the more they interact with the experience, um, they're able to take more from it. Well, for fleshy experiential, I think experiential is kind of coded with this um, sometimes detached, like cold, like laser, like I'm just going with what I imagine, like it, it has a certain feeling around it. Also experiential as an art form has been co-opted very much by, by selfie museums. Not only selfie museums, but also sort of, especially in the U.S., um, sort of experiential marketing. So mm -hmm. you see a lot of hijacking of the sort of immersive and installation and performance art uh, for, you know, selling shoes and such, um, which we do work with brands. And there's a way for that to really be beautiful and wonderful. Um, but it's the best when they're working directly with artists. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what you just said, which is. Experiential has really been co-opted, I think, mostly by experiential marketing and activations. And so experiential art people, it then became coded with like a selfie museum, like something that you could take a picture of yourself inside of. And that's kind of like what people started coding the word experiential with. This one thing that always came up for us was um, when Kusama had her piece at the Broad, there was lines around the corner for hours. And then in the same week that that line was there, we went to go see a documentary about Kusama's life. 
and the theater was empty. So what that told us was people loved the fact that they could go and they could be the subject of that artwork and they loved that they were providing that moment for them to be the center of this beautiful universe. But at the end of the day, it was about a photo of them inside the work that I think led to the lines versus people being like, why did she make this? What drove this? Why did she make mm-hmm. this phallic furniture? Like it was about fear of sex with men. Like the things that were behind the work and what really drove her to create, people didn't give a shit about, but they were very excited about being in something that she made when it catered to a selfie that they could then, you know, yeah. take. So that is something that for experiential, we are trying to like pivot away from. And so when we say fleshy, I think it's more um, being in touch with yourself, being in touch with being a human and like considering the human experience versus experiential mm-hmm. for like ending in a cool photograph. So it's like this thing where we want to just bring us back to our flesh and mm-hmm. our humanity and how we're actually connected to other people and not provide an experience that is just made to, you know, be a picture on Instagram. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think also when we talk about experiential, there's this sort of ex- expectation probably to have a bit of technology. And, and when we say fleshy experiential, I think that can also ap- apply to uh, how we'd like to use technology. Uh, mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, we've been a- as a society and as humans, we've been working with pen and paper and poetry and telling uh, a story through um, you know, film and all of these sort of different languages written and visual that we've been able to harness in a way uh, that we're really able to communicate in a poetic fashion and in an intimate fashion. And Anya and I were mm-hmm. talking last night about um, how rare it is to have intimacy in technology. Mm-hmm. And have a poetic poetic nature, have a fleshy nature. And I think it's it's mm-hmm. it's possible. It exists, but it's rare. And I when we say intimate, we don't mean in terms of extractive technologies where all the technologies <laughs> knows like, everything knows about every you. intimate detail, but you know, intimate in the right way in terms of communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for us it's really important. This ties to the concept of on view, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but our work on view, which really focuses on how mysterious the technology in our day-to-day lives are, you know, in order to just post and share something with my friends or a following, uh, you have to agree to a TNC. I had to do one the other day, and I was in a rush to post a story because it was going to expire in like 30 minutes, you know, that someone tagged me in. So I was like, okay, yeah, of course, agree to the TNC, right? What did I just agree to, you know? If we look into those things, it's it's quite chilling. And um, I think the mystery, you know, the technology we, we want in our art to be mysterious. We don't want it to be the focus. We don't want it to be a tech demo. We don't want it to be, to be showing off the capabilities. We want the technology to have a mysterious and poetic nature. But in our day-to-day lives, we want quite the opposite. No mystery <laughs> whatsoever. I mean, it's nice for it to, like, fall to the background and not interfere with our day-to-day sort of quality of life and yeah. allowing us to have a better quality of life. But that's not where we want the mystery. We want the mystery in the art. <laughs> yeah, right now it's like it's kind of flipped on its head where we have yeah. no mystery of the tech in art and then we have 100% mystery and zero transparency of how tech is in our daily lives. And we think it should be flipped around where we get the poetic mystery of using technology in art where tech isn't the focus and then in our daily day and our and then in our daily lives we have transparency regarding what technologies are being used on us what it means what we're agreeing to to use a certain service without having to like hire a lawyer to understand you know everything that we've given up to use a service yeah well first what i want to say is on view is so difficult to understand and it takes so much <laughs> to explain it um we had and to tour, while tour around the world describing it and we still are like <laughs> figuring out how to describe it because there's so many layers <laughs> it's like good that two people thinking. yeah it, it's like 500 pieces in one in terms of like we're, we need like a 500 page book yeah. just to write about every detail of the piece mm-hmm. so it's a big thing but in relationship to the idea of experiential art 
what mm-hmm. what we like about that, as annoying as it is, is that the piece cannot be understood in a photograph of you being there. The extent of the experience isn't like if someone was in there, that doesn't mean like you knew what it was like to experience the piece. The only people who know what it was like to experience the piece and ever will are the people who walked in it. They went from space one. They felt that the temperature was a little cold in space one. They went through. So it really was experiential, which in terms of sharing and talking about it is mm-hmm. super frustrating and annoying. Yeah. But but to also, us, it's evidence that it was an experience and right. it wasn't a photo opportunity. So but that's where I wanted I, to start. Yeah, yeah, and it's, sorry. Um, also, it was intentional in that way. Oh, yeah. Um, like, for instance, the most sort of the parts that you would want to film the most or take a photo the most, it was impossible to. Um, and that was by design. There were some areas where you could take a photo, um, but it was all kind of confusing in that way. But just to give you like a... We prioritized the in-person experience of people sure. there to whether it looked good in photos, mm-hmm. which is a whole other subject about yeah. prioritizing the experience or how it looks in documentation. Right. But mm-hmm. moving on, I think just to describe, you know, for, for those of you who don't know about OnView, OnView is... Um, on view looks at the generational desire to be the subject of an art experience and how that phenomenon uh, interplays with extractive technologies in our day-to-day life uh, and also surveillance capitalism. So it's kind of taking those um, kind of two aspects. It actually started more with the generational desire to be the subject of an art experience, you know, Mm -hmm. us creating works and then that weren't necessarily intended for someone to photograph themselves in, but they did it anyway. And then we had scenarios where we had to get bodyguards, bodyguards for the art, just like randomly. And we're like, Oh, this is so interesting. Uh, And then, so that became, and seeing what was happening in the climate of experiential marketing, that became an interesting subject. Uh, But then it slowly transformed into uh, extractive technology. Facial recognition is a technology we use uh, within uh, within on view. So do you want to talk? Yeah. So about that? and on view, it takes place in, in three phases. So the first phase is you enter into a space called the terms and condition intentionally without the S because we're talking about the human condition. Um, and so basically it's an immersive contract. And what we wanted to do is take that moment that Deja mentioned earlier, where you click a tiny box that's like this big that says, I agree. And then you keep going and it just doesn't feel like you did anything. What we wanted to do is show the weight of the act of agreeing. Um, So we took that tiny checkbox and we blew it up into this giant white room with a light box ceiling. It felt very sterile. It was kind of like you stepped inside of a contract and the room was kind of cold in temperature. And we had someone who was kind of like in a Cheshire cat kind of way, not answering your questions, but being very friendly. So it was kind of creepy, but it's really just creepy that we do that all the time without thinking about it. So that was kind of the first spaces where you stand there and then you stand in a circle that's in the center of the room and there's a light animation that circles your feet. And once you've done that, that means you've signed the contract that you're standing into. Uh, and then the there's a door that was opaque glass and it went transparent once you've agreed and then you're able to enter into the next phase. Yep. And the next phase, uh, leaving the terms and condition, you walk into the stages gallery. This is very much a black, disorienting, uh, inv- reflective environment. And uh, there are performers who are connected um, to the walls um, through their costumes and extension uh, strings, as well as there are two uh, photo stages. Um, These stages are, I would say, a theoretical parallel to the selfie stage, except there's one very important difference, which is the the exhibition will only photograph you if you're in a position that is designed by us. Uh, So we call that predictive choreography. So there were two stages. One is called, uh, I didn't sign up for this, uh, even though you just signed the contract. Uh, And then the other one is called (laughs) uh, data body. And so, uh, and this idea that we all have data bodies and we're very unsure of what those data bodies are, if Mm -hmm. they're accurate, if they're inaccurate, how they're being sold, how much they're being sold for, and when they're being collected and how 
they're being collected. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of the two references there. Um, but in data body, for example, uh, we have sensors in the floor. We use it, um, capacitive pinch sensors that we created custom, as well as capacitive sensors uh, for your hands. And we also have a look at sensor, uh, which uses facial detection to make sure that your head is in the correct position. Uh, we also perform facial recognition at that time because we begin to generate a profile uh, of that audience participant uh, starting there. Which you've agreed to, but people probably didn't read the contract on the wall. Yes, but we promise right. you that we won't do anything shady with your data, and it's also a closed system, uh, which we'll get back to later on the ethics um, around it being open and closed, which was mm -hmm. ubiquitous, ubiquitous computing's original intention. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, um, so once you have all the sensors, your hand left, right, you're standing on the sensors, your head is in the correct position, uh, then you begin to hear a countdown. Um, this countdown count, the counts down from 15 uh, down to one, which is quite a long time uh, for people to hold the position. And you hear, actually hold the position first, once you locked in the sensors, you hear the countdown, and then at the end of the countdown, um, your photo is taken via the exhibition. It's like this very grand, like it's uh, you're activating it, you're in this pose that we designed and then all of a sudden there's like this light leaking mm -hmm. on this black grass in front of you and it's really like this this like epic moment where it's it's almost and the reason behind But you can't experience it. But you, you can't know, experience that's, it's it like, because it's, it's for the yeah. photo. So basically, what we were talking about earlier with this desire to be the subject, we wanted to do something where we were like, what would we do if we satisfy this desire to be the subject? but we still remain the artists. So we mm -hmm. wanted to design. If you want to be the subject of the artwork, you can be the subject of the artwork, but we are still the artists. Therefore, you have to be the subject that we are designing in order for you to be the subject of yeah. our art. Which so is you the can first be the subject, line. That's but a, the first line of the TNC. Yeah, that it is sense. the first line of the contract. It's, it's like, like, you are the subject, we are the artist. So we get yeah. to design, and you can only get a photo in here if you do it kind of under our creative constraints, which is the purpose of the predictive choreography. Yeah, well, I think maybe even a good transition would be to explain how OnView ends. Yeah. Because I think this leads into maybe some of my ideas, at least, of where social media uh, and extractive technologies will take us and and how that will shape and how that will shape behavior as well um so once you leave the stages gallery the last phase of the exhibition is the golden gallery the golden gallery is like i mean it looks like a fine art standard mm -hmm. fine art environment uh complete with a security guard who is actually a performer but he's trained to be bored and and yawn occasionally and he's there to protect the art which we tell you we will protect um uh, we will protect the art, but we will also protect the data, uh, but we say it in a more Cheshire Cat way uh, in the TNC. And um, so he's in there protecting the art, and you are told also you'll be on view. Uh, so you go up to the art case, and you are on view, but only to yourself. So we perform uh, facial recognition, we recall your, um, your profile, and uh, we show your image. And if you walk away, that image, you know, it, there's no other way to recall that image. So it's, it's, and there's also no other way to receive the image. The only way that you can receive the image is if you take a photo of, um, of the art case that you're standing in front of. Which is so meta. So you're taking a yeah. photo of a picture of you mm -hmm. in the art case in the museum. So it's like you've become the fine art. But it's wow. like, but then you realize, like, I am the subject, I am the fine artwork, I'm the subject of this piece. But then that's not enough because everyone was like, where do I get the photo? So the experience of even being in a gold frame, which we picked one that was similar to the one that's, um, that holds the Mona Lisa, is that that moment doesn't matter. What matters is what you can do with evidence of that experience after. And so that was something that I think when people left and they might have spent 30 minutes in on view and loved it and left, but felt this like they were robbed of the point, which is the image takeaway from the piece, which we said you were the subject, but we made them realize how much they missed and what maybe their whole intention of going to a museum that day was, which was a photo of them doing something. But also like how you mentioned the hyperbole in the mm -hmm. TNC, right? 
that also exists within the Golden Gallery because people were very weirded out that their photo was there and they're like, how, how did our photo get there? Some people had ideas, some people knew how it was happening um, and some people were fine with it and didn't ask questions, but others were like, how did it get there? And also what is going to happen to that image now? Like when, mm-hmm. I, when I leave, is where is that image going? And they were very concerned about where is their image going? Now, On View is a closed, closed system. Right. It wasn't connected to the Internet at all. Um, And that, I think, begins to answer, I think, this next question of where do we see social media going and how it ties to surveillance capitalism, which is, you know, you have a business, you know, any any sort of app on your phone. Um, The service that they're providing is kind of like a side note, uh, but it's more of the sort of. Um, surveillance dividends that they're cashing in on, right? So, you know, they're making less money on the app uh, and that service that they're providing and making more money on extracting your data and then selling that, um, which you agree to when you use the service. When you click the little box. Right. And now we have also that same sort of technology, extractive technologies in our home. So back in like the 80s when ubiquitous computing first became a concept and Internet of Things, which is kind of now more called that and pervasive computing. Um, the idea was that it would be more, have a more humanist, humanistic quality in which like it would be more of a closed system, right? Mm-hmm. So you have aware devices and those aware devices have, you know, awareness of where you are as a human and therefore they're not sort of bugging you and notifying you all the time. Um, right now we have ubiquitous computing. It's everywhere. Uh, but the issue that we're running t- into now is that all of these extractive technologies um, are, are doing it in a way that, one, we don't know uh, what information and what data that we're leaking and what is being captured. And mm-hmm. two, um, you know, all of these interfaces, all of these apps are designed um, to be addictive, right? So they're addictive interfaces. And that is the opposite of the first intention of ubiquitous computing, which was allow us to be more human. So right now, and in the field of art and technology and speaking, you know, with and about the Lumen Prize and the whole field of art and technology, um, interaction, I think, is something that we're trained now to expect and it's like there's this very one-to-one ratio of like if I do this then this happens and use of technology and art a lot of times is kind of based on these sort of one-to-one interactions where again in a weird way you're asking the technology or the technology is asking you to do something for it so we have this like humans in the service of technology model Versus like technology in the service of human connection or technology in the service of intimacy, technology in the service of a moment of reflection, you know, which are all probably better uses. Um, And so what we like to think about in the piece that we had been commissioned for um, ADO in Brooklyn, which didn't open due to COVID, was a piece that we were trying to pivot away from, like using art and technology. Well, we like to not separate art and tech. We like to say we make art using technology um, because we like to, they should just kind of fall into the category of art, but that's just a tool that we use. Um, But pivoting away from something that's like asking the audience to, to pay attention to it, which is like what a notification does. And instead thinking about using art and tech, using technology to help people dwell and to help people be present. So how do you live like around technology? Mm -hmm. How do you dwell with technology without it doing, you know, this to you, Mm -hmm. whether that's an artwork that's like, do this, touch this. Um, That's something we want to pivot. We want to see pivot in the real life sphere in our daily lives, as well as in the kind of digital art community. Like how can we help people be more present and drop into a moment Mm -hmm. And we make more dwelling art rather Mm -hmm. than interactive art. Yeah. And I I would even, yeah, I totally agree. And I think, I think there is a sort of tendency to, you know, when a technology is novel, um, you know, there's this sort of 
aspect of wanting to explore that. But once that trick has been done and once that sort of, you know, tech exploration has been done, you know, now you're ready to create a poem, you know, um, but you have to first, you know, learn how to, to use this technology. In our practice, uh, we like to ask if the tech is no longer novel, will the project still hold up? Because, you know, tech doesn't age very well, right? But concepts age very well. And, and so if a concept is strong, let's rely on that rather than the technology to kind of give us a sort of tech demo um, or a wow moment. And, you know, Yvonne Rayner, say no to spectacle, um, which you know, is, is, is something that we find um, very important for our practice, that it's, it's not something that sort of allows them to, you know, sort of jump in and escape all their problems and, you know, Ooh, for all oh, wow, five seconds and you could walk away and you like saw the, the right. point. And the problem is technology is very good at doing that. So mm -hmm. it's like, how do you, how do you reel that back in? Right. How do you pull in like pull back the wow factor and use technology in a more nuanced way. At least that's what we want to do in our practice. Which is why even if we're using something that's, that is an interesting technology or something newer, mm -hmm. we're like, is this, does this make sense conceptually? Like, is this conceptually grounded to use this? So that way the message mm -hmm. in 50 years, the message and what we're trying to say is still there. And it wasn't relying on, you know, the novelty of the technology to make the work something mm -hmm. like worth engaging yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. And this idea of like visible technology doesn't equal high tech too. kind of those, right. those things aren't necessarily synonymous and shouldn't be conflated. And I think for us, we try to hide the technology, even just from a aesthetic preference, hi hiding the tech and kind of drawing from ubiquitous computing and sort of the sensibilities of industry 4.0, where all of the technology is in the background and indistinguishable from your everyday life, um, but it is still, you're still interacting with a virtual system. There's just no virtual layer between you and, you know, that virtual world, between the physical world and the virtual world. So I think it's very confusing sometimes when people mm -hmm. see on view and they're like, wait, that's digital art? Because <laughs> it just looks like, you know, Mm -hmm. plywood and paint and sort of plexi and it's like performers and it's mm -hmm. so fleshy in that way it's like where's the technology some people are like how is that working but in the background we're using tech touch designer to network over 20 network devices uh, to integrate real-time facial recognition dmx light control um kinetic, kinetic winch control. kinetic winch control guest profile generation uh, and all that is connected by hundreds and hundreds of feet of um, you know, fiber optic cable, you know, kind of running back uh, into touch designer. So it's like, it's highly complex, but you, you don't see that. I think because there's so many ver there's so many like layers to the, like we also make films. So like a lot of mine are directors, um, like Chantal Ackerman, for example, is hugely influential like we love slow cinema like the whole movement around slow cinema and also try to apply mm -hmm. some of the qualities and like the values of the slow cinema movement into our art so that would be like mm -hmm. Bella Tarr, Roy Anderson, Chantel Ackerman are all mm -hmm. significant um I think in the realm of performance obviously Marina Abramovich is is someone that has just been She's just she made a lot possible for performance artists. Um, mm -hmm. So her work, of course. Mm -hmm. Yvonne Rayner. Yvonne Rayner. I mean, also the entire EAT movement experiments. Mm -hmm. um, that entire movement and all of the artists were, that were part of that collective were, I think, extremely impactful uh, on my practice as well um, because it really shows a sort of um, synergy between engineering and our artistic practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then also, you know, weirdly, so Mark Weiser, who is uh, a scientist uh, at IBM Park uh, mm -hmm. and ubiquitous computing was um, his his sort of domain in that, uh, like 1985 and late 80s. Um, so that's also very interesting. There's a lot, and it's literally like there's writers, there's uh, everyone directors. Everyone in that, the Black Mountain College scene was pretty cool, too. Mm -hmm. We could, It's a we lot. Could, it's a whole... I think we'll just puddle. write this all yeah, down and send you a, a link. On on. Yeah. Inspiration from, <laughs> from all over the expressive realm, so that's cool. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it looks like we are just about out of time. Uh, so
So I wanted to thank you both for coming on. It was wonderful to learn more about your practice and chat a little bit more about on view. So thank you both very much. Thank you, thank you Madeline. Us.